Now let's get on with the show. Our first speakers today, uh, we're going to have a twofer, twofer Monday. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nydia Ruff and Brian Bellendorf. Uh, Nydia serves as the at-large director and chairperson of the Linux Foundation Board of Directors. Uh, Nydia has a long history of service in open source, having championing the adoption of enterprise, uh, adoption of open source in the enterprise, influencing organizations to invest in and give back to open source communities. Uh, she actively works to advance the mission of the Linux Foundation in building sustain a sustainable ecosystem that's built upon open collaboration, which is pretty amazing. Nydia joins, uh, she joined Amazon as the head of the open source program office, where she'll continue to drive investment and compliance in open source. She's a passionate advocate and a speaker for opening doors to new and diverse people in technology. So I'm going to invite her up to the stage to help get plugged in. And after Nydia speaks, we're going to have Brian Bellendorf, who's the general manager of the OpenSSF. Brian founded and helped lead open source communities and initiatives for more than 30 years. First as the founder of uh, Apache Software Foundation, and then later as a founding member of both the Open Source Initiative and the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, Brian has co-founded uh, or was the CTO of a series of startups, including Wired Magazine, Organic Online, and CollabNet before pivoting towards public service in the White House as a CTO office under President Obama and then served as a CTO for the World Economic Forum. So please welcome me in joining Nydia and let's give her a nice round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I know it's common to say gray beards in uh, open source. There's also others with gray hair, like me. Uh, and uh, I must admit that one of the privileges of having been in open source for so long is a chance to talk about history and what we've learned from history and why we are at the moment we are today with OpenSSF and what we need to do to move the needle uh, from an OpenSSF perspective. As, as um, we indicated, I sit on the board um, and I'm very excited to also be part of the um, Amazon Open Source Program Office and uh, really acknowledging Juneteenth, acknowledging Pride Month, and I love, love, love the Linux Foundation logo uh, that's uh, really reflecting uh, what we're celebrating this month. So let me start with the 80s and 90s, when I actually was around. <laughs> and I was involved in open source uh, around 1998. So I think we, we've got to acknowledge that open source came from um, very, very uh, fringe uh, elements, code, if you will. It wasn't an enterprise thing. It wasn't invented by some company. It wasn't created in some company. It was really uh, you know, folks in the MIT research lab saying, how can we give people the freedom to actually examine software, modify software, change software, et cetera. And so therein was born GNU and the Free Software Foundation and the license called GPL, which gave people uh, a number of freedoms, freedom to modify, freedom to share source code, uh, freedom to distribute, freedom to uh, use it for any purpose that they want, which was a dramatical departure from how software was typically shared. I think this is important because during these days, uh, in the 80s and 90s, companies really hadn't fully discovered open source yet, and they feared open source, and it was kind of on the side. And then comes the 90s, and you start seeing you know, people like Linus Torvalds reveal, uh, releasing um, le the, the kernel that he had created, and he used GPL to uh, share this with others, which some people say is the reason why Linux, uh, Linux became so widely adopted and shared, and the innovation was so fast and so aggressive, and you know, there was just so much collaboration, open collaboration going on. And then comes you know, the open source initiative, which was founded to kind of protect the freedoms, uh, the open source definition and the freedoms of open source. And the term open source really came into being. Before that, it was really free and open source software. A lot of companies thought, oh my gosh, free sounds economically free. And I don't want to associate myself with something that people have an expectation that I give away for free. 
you know, as uh, from an economic perspective. So the word open source was coined actually by a woman uh, consultant, Christine, and I forget Christine's last name. And then uh, comes open source uh, development labs. And here's an interesting um, thing because companies actually came together to create open source DL and also free standards group because they felt that they needed to collaborate together to take this new thing called Linux and open source forward and make it enterprise ready. And so they felt that they needed to come together in a neutral way, uh, you know, in some sort of a foundation way to really uh, work on this together and that no one company could do it, you know, by themselves. Then comes the foundation called Apache, which Brian knows very well, and he may uh, cover some of that in his, uh, in his talk. Apache is a 501c3, so it was started as a nonprofit, started to protect the emerging development of Tomcat and other Apache web servers and you know, projects. Um, and the Linux Foundation also came into being around the same time, and it was started more as a trade association and with the merger of the Free Standards Group and the OSDL. And again, it was to protect this nascent thing called open source and Linux and to grow this and develop this and move this forward and make it available for all of us. And also to provide a neutral home for the creator, Lena Storvalls, so that everyone could benefit from the work that he did. And then to start you know, creating the constructs like open governance and uh, how do we deal with trademarks and legal uh, constructs around open source and how do we build community and, and so on and so forth. And then you start seeing some young uh, new companies, tech companies like Sun and SGI and HP who start saying, how can I start using Linux in my servers? How can I ship product based on Linux? How can I support uh, Linux? And IBM here hit it out of the park by uh, doing a $1 billion, I think, um, support. Uh, Jeff will correct me if I'm wrong. One billion, I think, is the number. And started the Eclipse Foundation and started saying, we believe in Linux. And that then became, um, I guess, a, a call to action, if you will, for other companies to say, I think Linux is something that companies should use and adopt, and it's become mainstream, and you know, it's something that uh, we can work with. Um, then you start seeing a number of companies that were born in the age of open source, like Google and Facebook and Amazon and Netflix. And they built from ground up using open source. They built these hyperscale, web scale companies uh, using open source to fuel um, their search engines or social media or dot com or streaming. And they also did something interesting. They started kind of uh, contributing back projects um, that they had used in production. So you started seeing things like Hadoop um, and other uh, big, big projects being contributed back. And so you now start seeing a huge body of work that's scalable and usable by companies and uh, you know, becomes safe to start kind of really building on open source. The clouds start building on open source. So if, if you pivot a lot of companies who really created their own infrastructures for say, in the case of Amazon for .com, they start saying, I wonder if other companies could use the same infrastructure and could benefit from this infrastructure and start creating cloud services. And so also you can see Google doing the same, Microsoft doing the same and other cloud companies. And then people started saying, I want to see, use open source, but can you deliver it as a service? So we start seeing cloud companies deliver Kubernetes as a service and, and other things as a service. Um, the other adoption that started happening, I would say in the 2000s and beyond, and I actually worked for an enterprise company called Comcast, is that enterprises, which were not at all in the business of systems, right? Uh, were in banking or in media and entertainment or were in retail, um, started saying, you know what? I need to build my business on software. I need to digitally transform. I need to become a software company because I am competing with new upstarts in the technology side and my customers want a transformed experience. And in order to be agile 
and digitally forward, I need to start using software. So you start seeing enterprises using open source software very, very prevalently. I ran the open source program office at Comcast, so you can imagine Capital One has one, Target has uh, an open source program office, Fidelity, and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is you're seeing industry after industry, organization after organization start using open source, including open data, open hardware, and new industries like energy, and you start seeing agriculture, healthcare. And we are building so much on open source. Our digital infrastructure is built on open source. So there's so much writing on open source today. And so the protection of all this is so, so critical uh, today. And open source in governments is such a thing because governments are realizing they need to transform digitally, but they also need to be transparent and working much more closely with their um, citizens and also develop industry in their country and encourage innovation, et cetera. So all this comes up to say success and ubiquity of open source comes with responsibilities. Because now so much of the world depends upon us and is built upon open source, it is so incumbent upon us to make sure that that trust is not betrayed and that faith is, is supported in what we do. It means that we need to grow up. It need, means that we need to find a way to uh, secure open source. And especially in the last uh, decade or so, there's been so many, many uh, issues with Heartbleed and Log4j, et cetera, that have really kind of created an alarm for us to say, I think we need to work better at this. You know, unlike working with one monolithic maybe blob of code from a proprietary company where you can hold them accountable, it's a whole different ball game in open source. And so what happens with open source suppliers, now we have suppliers who are diverse. There's like, I don't know, millions of projects that we consume, big and small. Some have maybe great security postures, some don't. Some are well-maintained, some don't. Um, so you really don't have a standard in terms of how you work with them, how you maintain them, et cetera. And most of the open source projects were started with solving a technical problem in mind. So most of the maintainers tend to be innovators and problem solvers, but they're not security folks, they're not documenters, they're not community leaders, and they need the help. They need to uh, know how to do it right. And many lack security training. Um, frankly, security and open source groups used to be separate, right, in companies and in, you know, in, in life. So, so they were different disciplines, and so they often never talked. And maintainer burnout is also real. A lot of maintainers are saying, I can't do this much anymore, and so I need help. I need help to uh, maintain the software. I need help to do it right, and I can't do it alone. And then you see the supply side, which is our users like us. You start seeing us using open source more and more for mission critical things. I mean, a company, businesses, and infrastructure like energy grids are built on open source. These are pretty mission critical things. They've gone are the days when people would say, I think I'll do something light on open source and for production I'll use, you know, proprietary. And developers, I, I, I feel a lot of new developers take open source for granted because it's just there, it's used by everybody, you see it as a de facto standard, you say, oh, it's, it's, it's already vetted by so many people I don't need to do my due diligence. I can just download it. I don't need to know the license. I don't need to know the help. I'll just use it. And a lot of dependency management tools are also pretty lacking um, and need a lot more development. Uh, you can see your direct dependencies, but you may not be able to see all of your transitive dependencies and then how to deal with it which ones to deal with, and, and I know there's a lot of work going on with our sponsors and others to improve this, but it's still, still a challenge. 
And uh, a lot of companies still struggle with how do we work with upstream? How much uh, should we invest in upstream? Do we really need to put some people directly involved in upstream? Uh, and do we develop a policy around open source security? And upstream especially is one hard thing to solve inside a company because we are, we are really created to um, serve customers and customer problems always come first. And you never, and you think, you know, you don't see the long-term positive benefits of contributing to open source because it's an indirect benefit. And so you kind of don't see why you need to have a seat at the table or get, give back to community and make sure that it's sustained and make sure that you are improving it. Uh, and that needs to change. So you can see a mismatch between open source, how open source suppliers work and how open source users work. And this needs to come together. So I want to end by saying um, that's why history has taught us, as you can see, throughout the adoption of open source in various industries and various phases of open source, collaboration has always come to the rescue. Collaboration of industries coming together, companies coming together, foundations kind of acting as a, as a neutral home, if you will, for people to come together and solve big, big problems. And what's also interesting in, with the open source security issue is that uh, the government is now getting involved as well. And they're saying, um, we need this to change because it is a nation at risk and it is um, infrastructure at risk and it's citizens at risk. And so I think collaboration is coming to the rescue again, open collaboration to help us all come together to solve this big initiative that we have in front of us of securing open source. So I know I have five minutes left, but I am done and I'm gonna hand it off to Brian so that Brian can really take you into the practicalities of how we do this. Thank you. Thank you.